As an ardent A's fan, I bought into the Moneyball philosophy for 25 years. But not one World Series, no pennants, and a 13 and 28 postseason record? Let's call it for what it is a nickel dime operation. Hey everyone, this is Will O'Toole welcoming you to Park Ridge Sports History. This week I'd like to focus on the end of the baseball season, the potential chances for the uh, New York Yankees going forward into the postseason as, as I'm taping this show. They technically haven't really secured their playoff spot because all things can happen in a miraculous way for the Seattle Mariners and the Toronto Blue Jays, which may have the Yankees uh, really grasping for straws as, as we're going forward. But I'd like to do a little statistical research this week and just give you kind of uh, the chances of some of the teams uh, in the World Series, uh, in the postseason, getting into the World Series and, uh, you know, their chances of winning. This week, I, I know, I focused on Billy Bean with the Oakland A's, and, of course, he has really brought to the attention, really, metrics, the whole Bill James revolution into looking at statistics as more than just uh, strictly home runs, RBIs, and wins and losses. But uh, Bill James really, really uh, – ushered in the era of digging deeper into the stats and really taking into a different appreciation of walks on base percentage and slugging average. However, with the Bill James revolution and, of course, the war as a tool for um, uh, almost it's an algebraic uh, formula to rate the players uh, there comes a time when you start to say, and believe me, this is not an indictment of Billy Bean. He's done really a pretty good job there. As I, as I stated, they're 13 and 28 in their postseason games, but they've really made the postseason 11 times in his 25 years of service as general manager and, and really being in boss of putting the Oakland A's together. The problem is for Billy Bean and the Oakland A's, is that prior to him coming aboard, the A's won four World Series in Oakland. And I know that uh, Charlie Finley always gets quite a bit of uh, criticism for the way he treated the players. But one thing you cannot deny with Charlie Finley is that uh, he was a great, great evaluator of talent. He made some shrewd deals during the early 70s, acquiring, of course, Ken Holtzman and, and getting a bench that was filled with really good, productive players who could be fit in at a moment's notice. I'm, I'm thinking of the Tommy Davises, the Matty Alou's, the Felipe Alou's, who all came aboard. I'm talking about pitchers that they acquired, the emergence of Raleigh Fingers as from going from starter to uh, their relief uh, pitcher specialist and rivaling at that time the Mike Marshalls and the Bruce Suters in the game as the uh, chief fireman for the Oakland A bullpen. You know, they had guys like Paul Lindblad and uh, other players, Blue Moon Odom, who all contributed. I mean, Odom came up through the system. The others were acquired from teams that were seen as crummy, like the Washington Centers. You know, the A's got guys like Mike Epstein to come aboard and really produce for them on that 72 team. They went out and got a Don Mincher. So these are all players that Charlie Finley added to uh, his really good core players of Jackson, Bando, Hunter, Campanaris, and then got uh, other players. You know, people don't realize this. He acquired Billy North who uh, moved to center field in the Rick Monday uh, uh, trade. When they acquired Bill North, he was kind of like a throw-in because they really got Ken Holtzman. And as I've raved about Holtzman, you know, maybe he's not a Hall of Famer, but he was definitely a key component to those A's teams of 72, 73, and 74. And of course, he hurt he hurt the Mets with a, a big double in the in the World Series, and I think he hurt the Reds as well. And then you have the emergence of Gene Tennis. Uh, really, when you think about it, one of the uh, stereotypical uh, metric players of the early 70s, a big walk guy, home run guy, uh, 
had a huge on-base percentage at a time when walks really weren't appreciated until now. Anyway, all that being said, you, you have to start to wonder, is the A's version of Moneyball really working? Because, let's face it, they've come up dry in the postseason. The postseason has been a desert for the Oakland A's. And I could actually really defend, and, and, and I'm not criticizing Bean in any way. I do like the whole approach. But, you know, after a while, you got to win too. And the problem with the A's is that they won with a low budget team or uh, they won in a small market city back in the 70s and 80s. And, you know, you could actually argue this. Finley moves the team out of Kansas City, where I think they had 17 of 18 losing seasons, comes to Oakland in 68. They immediately uh, go over 500. And by 1971, they win the, the Western Division. 72, 73, 74, not only do they win the division and the pennant, but they win the World Series. And then in 88, 89, and 90, they do the same thing with the exception of only winning one World Series with Tony La Russa's gang of uh, Mark McGuire and company and Jose Canseco and company. But after that, they've done nothing. And you start to say, okay, if this were any other maybe city, Tampa Bay, let's say after 25 years, never sniffed the postseason until Billy Bean came aboard. And maybe he doesn't win the whole prize, the big ring of the World Series. But you can see that what he's done has massively put a franchise into contending every year. You can see that. But you're talking about an A's franchise in Oakland. It's won four World Series. And prior to him getting there was highly competitive, indeed was uh, a, a two-time dynasty in the making in separate decades, the 70s and the 80s. And yet here's Bean really not coming up with anything except losing 28 of 41 postseason games. And every year it always seems, and this is the perception, okay, the A's have built this team to win. And I always think, okay, let's see them win. They think that they've assembled a team that's won. Let's see them do it. And it comes to a point where you start to say, when is it going to happen? Or are they missing something? Is there a key component that they are missing? I've always maintained, I think what does help a franchise is that franchise figure for a team. For instance, Tom Seaver will be forever uh, defined as a New York Met, and he will ever define the 69 Miracle Mets. You can make an argument Brooks, Jim Palmer, and Frank Robinson were all uh, the faces of the Orioles teams of the uh, late 60s, early 70s. So the, uh, Johnny Bench, of course, with the big red machine with Pete Rose and, uh, and, and a cast of others, all these, all these guys. And I'm going to make this observation today that Madison Baumgarner, is the face of the franchise, along with maybe Buster Posey, of the San Francisco Giants, as they have won three times in uh, the last 10 years in San Francisco, while Oakland A's have come up short. And really, when you think about it, okay, maybe culturally San Francisco and Oakland are different, but really, are they in terms of, uh, I, I don't know, marketing, uh, probably population, probably San Francisco, probably the wealth, maybe more, or, or the perception is San Francisco, maybe more uh, wealth with the uh, technology side of it. And Oakland is seen as more blue collar and all the rest of it. But basically you have two Bay Area teams. And the irony is when the A's were doing well, San Francisco was complaining that they were a small market team in essence. And that's why they couldn't win. Now it seems the opposite has occurred. With San Francisco with the brand new ballpark, I get it. Oakland with that dump that they can they call a field. But nevertheless, it has, you know, shifted almost a, a seesaw with the weight now going towards San Francisco and, and Oakland on the outside looking in. My whole point being is that really Bean has got to get the money ball to produce. And then after a while, you say, okay, if they win once, will they win again? And is this really a formula for success? 
or as I maintain, I think they're still coming up short some way, somehow, maybe missing one component. And listen, I don't have the brains of the Billy Beanses or the other GMs, the Brian Cashmans. Uh, I'm not obviously uh, in the locker rooms. I'm not in the front office. I don't know what their strategies are, what really their budgets. They may have a budget out there, but what the true budget is, what they think of their players and all the rest of it. Yet, just from the observation, 25 years, no World Series, no pennant, not even a postseason uh, win in a series, not even wild card wins. And then I look at San Francisco, three World Series during that same time frame. And I look at the previous Oakland franchises, and they have four World Series titles and six appearances in the World Series. All right. Now, that brings me to probably the discussion of today. I was doing some research again, albeit it was not so much quick, but I would, it's like any kind of research. Sometimes you feel like you've done too much. Other times you say, do I have enough? But I'm just going to go on. Here's Billy Bean, though, in his days, and it's black and white. I chose black and white for two reasons. One is I couldn't get the color to work on the printer. That's number one. And I wasn't going to play with it. As Howard knows, uh, the last two weeks I've had to uh, press upon him to help me put, let's say, the baseball card pictures up on the uh, on the viewing. So I'm going with black and white here today. That's Billy Bean as a baseball player with the Minnesota Twins. You know, he was selected by the Mets in the draft. And I kind of and deliberately did this and put him next to Mike Trout because Mike Trout, let's face it, he's seen as one of uh, the top five players, if not the top player in baseball. I know he's had injuries this year. Nevertheless, I couldn't believe this either. He's 30 years old already. I was amazed at that when I saw that. But, you know, Trout, probably I, I've equated and I've said this to a buddy of mine. I really wish baseball had done more about this. And I, I, I'm i really ardent about this. Faces of the franchise. You know, we think of Ted Williams. You think of immediately the Red Sox. Or Yastrzemski, you think of the Red Sox. You think of the Reds, you think of Bench. Will, uh, Wilbur, Willie Stargell and Roberto Clemente, the faces of the, uh, of the Pirates. Mantle, of course, the face of the Yankees. Well, Mike Trout without a doubt, is the greatest angel of all time. He is the face of the franchise. And I really thought, from a selfish standpoint, baseball needed to keep, I really believe this, three players at home. One was, of course, Trout. They accomplished that with Trout staying with the Angels. Another one was Manny Machado. I, I really thought he should have stayed with the Orioles. Now, I understand completely why he leaves the Orioles. I mean, take a look at how that organization is in such disarray. I mean, I don't even know if they have a, a compass leading them out of the woods right now. They're, that's how horrible that franchise is. And the other guy was Bryce Harper. Uh, I really thought that Harper should have stayed with the Nationals. I get why they leave. And maybe the Harper situation might have been a little bit different. Uh, him signing with the Phillies instead of staying with the Nationals. It is interesting. He leaves the Nationals and they, they win the World Series. Right now, you would say that Jose Altuve staying with the Astros. and But here's the problem with the Astros. They do have a lot of controversy there. But at least he is and will probably be the face of the Astros for years to come, much like Biggio was uh, during the 90s and Bagwell. So, I really thought what I did like with Trout is that he is the face of the franchise. And I really thought baseball needs like three or four players to really stay with their teams and uh, stay as the face of the franchise, which I think in many ways why, you know, Aaron Judge potentially staying with the Yankees for the rest of his career will be good, not just for the Yankees, but for baseball as well. Because you need that identification. Now think about it. And this, in a uh, going in a circular mode, think about the A's. 
Tell me what player on the A's has been the face of the franchise for the last 25 years or that you would consider the face of the franchise during the Moneyball era of Billy Bean. If you think of the 70s, immediately come into mind Reggie Jackson. You think of the 80s, McGuire and Canseco. I'm not saying they stayed with the clubs, but they definitely were the face of the franchise. There really isn't a player that the A's have that you can go to and say, ah, man, he really is leading the A's. You kind of almost want to root for the A's because you want to see this guy uh, win the world championship. I don't think there was a, a doubt that many baseball fans would have loved to have seen Yaz win a World Series. We're happy to see Al Kaline win a World Series 68 Tigers. Uh, we're gratified that Willie Stargell was not only won a World Series again with the Pirates, but was indeed the MVP back in 79. That Schmidt, who was the face of the franchise for the Phillies, wins a World Series. Now it's almost imperative that a guy like a Trout wins a World Series with the Angels to really put mm, a trademark on his career. Uh, same thing with the A's. They're lacking a franchise player. Now, Going back to the whole playoff format, I came up with, and obviously fans out there can argue with this, I hope you do, but I, I took about six or seven statistics. And I know that Bill James, when he originally came out, he could almost predict who was going to win the World Series based on some statistical evidence that he did plugged in the numbers of the World Series winners, probably also of the pennant winners from that, that particular year. But I'm just going to say this. Let's say it was the uh, 1975 Reds. The only reason I'm thinking that is because I can just peel off the names of the, of the players. It could be any year, but I'm just taking that as uh, for one, for one um, example. Bill James took statistics like batting average, win-loss record, um, ERA, runs scored, uh, home runs, doubles, and all the rest of it, and basically affixed a certain number and then put those numbers into a formula and came out with certain things. And it was almost like, I have to give James credit. It was, I, I don't know whether he put the numbers in and then came out with a percentage, but, uh, or he was able to, do an opposite way or whatever he did with a math mathematical formula. Anyway, he came up with a formula that stated that actually if your pitchers gave up more walks, you had a tendency to win more World Series. If your teams, um, let's say, actually, I think, let's, uh, I'm going to say this, if they hit more doubles than triples, it was to your benefit. Obviously, if a team hit, hit more home runs, there was a tendency to win more World Series. So he was doing it on the percentage of winning the World Series. Anyway, I kind of have assembled statistics, and uh, the Yankee fans that have watched this program in the past couple of weeks know where I'm coming from. So I did runs, uh, four runs against. I did home runs. I did the top pitcher with the most innings on uh, each particular team, and then I did saves. Now, I only took the World Series winners for the last 25 years. I didn't do the entire going all the way back to 1903. Why? Because I think that everyone can, uh, would be in agreement that over the last 25 or 26 years, baseball has gone to an expanded playoff version where even wild card teams like the Red Sox have gone on and won the World Series even though they haven't won the division. And I, I compiled some stats, and then I figured what I could do is maybe uh, look at the teams that are in for the postseason this year, potentially. And of course, going into today, baseball really needs this in, in, in many respects. And I am actually hoping that both the Red Sox and the Yankees lose, and that Tampa Bay and Seattle win, because it would have four teams then uh, vying for those two wild card spots and it would expand and there would be more chaos, which would just create really a good week for baseball. They'd have to push off the wild card games to put these games into play. So anyway, that's what I'm rooting for. Just the utter chaos of four teams all finishing with the same record. And I'll tell you this, 90 wins is a great season. And all four teams have a chance, not just to win 90, but I believe 91 
which is incredible. And last week, of course, on our show, I, I, I felt really sorry, and I can't stand the Dodgers, nor do I like the Giants. But you got to give both teams some uh, some sort of I, – I, I'm going to have some sympathy for the team, uh, either San Francisco or the Dodgers, that finishes in the wild card spot. And right now it looks like the Dodgers because they have to play a one-game playoff. Now, they do have to play potentially the Cardinals – who have been the hottest team over the last three weeks. But that doesn't mean anything in a wild card because it's almost like the Cardinals were finally stopped after 15 or 16 in a row. But for that one game, anything can happen. You could be no hit uh, in the postseason. Or you could get into a 9-8 game where your best pitcher, and of course the Dodgers are going to be missing Kershaw, just is flat in the first few innings. And then you got a battle, and you only get that one nine-inning game to do it. And you say to yourself, Wow, after 104, 105 wins, it comes down to 27 outs. And I know it happens, and it's baseball, and you know that going in. But in many respects, if baseball really wants the best teams in the postseason, I really am under now the belief because baseball has ruined, in many respects, all the traditions with uh, interleague play and, and all the rest of it. But I really am under the belief that baseball should really do this award both the Dodgers and the Giants, uh, not so much divisions, but the first two or the top records, and let the other teams figure it out. And then, really, you'd have the two teams with the best records. And in baseball, it's a little bit different because if you win 100 games, as the Dodgers and the Giants are doing, you're well over 40 games over 500. That's an incredible season. Winning 90 is awesome. Winning over 100 and having nothing to show for it, it's devastating to a franchise. I'm sorry. It is. Anyway, here's what I was going through. And I'm just going to pop these pictures up real quick because Ramon Ortiz is an interesting figure. And I just opposed him next to Madison Baumgartner. Uh, I would say this. If the Giants don't have Madison, they don't win any of their World Series. Here's the irony. I was looking at the statistics, and Ortiz, for the 2002 Anaheim Angels, ready for this? He pitched 217 innings. And that is one of the top guys uh, in all of the uh, statistics I did. In fact, ready for this? Um, Ortiz had 217. Actually, the top pitcher in the last 25 years that I, I compiled these playoffs, ready for this, Mark Burley, who I've often touted for the Hall of Fame. I think he's right up there. He's a cusp Hall of Famer, and really, the, the veterans, well, the committee should really take a look at what he's done. First of all, and, and this is just going to give him more reinforcement for me. He actually pitched the most innings of any World Series winning uh, team. He has the most innings of any World Series winning team as a starter. All right. 236.2 innings he pitched for the 2005 White Sox. Burley was incredible that year. And why I really think he should be touted is that he had a number of big seasons, not just with uh, the White Sox, but he goes to the Toronto Blue Jays. Uh, I kind of think of him as a combination of Mickey Lolich with the body ad, which was rather expansive, but he definitely was a horse. And he really had some good stuff. 236 innings, the highest total of any World Series uh, starting pitcher that obviously won the World Series over the last 25 years. And you're talking about Greg Maddox. You're talking about Andy Pettit. You are talking about, well, actually, I have to go back to Kevin Brown. Actually, Brown has 237.1. And Burley, I meant to say for an American League winner. Uh, 236.2. I just got off on a tangent with, with him. But those are the two big horses for World Series winners. 237 innings and 236. Okay? Not much of a difference. Brown, though, did it for the 97 Florida Marlins. 
And of course, uh, Burley did it for the White Sox in 2005. However, you can make a case for Burley for the Hall of Fame in the fact that he ended a long, long drought for the White Sox. Remember, they hadn't won a pennant since 1959. They hadn't won a World Series since the early 20, 20th century. And, uh, of course, they always have the mark against them with the Black Sox scandal and all the rest of it. So him, I really think that baseball should probably look for his, uh, look more serious at his, his stats. And, you know, he kind of left baseball. You know, the uh, Toronto Blue Jays made the postseason a few years ago. It's probably about 10 now. And he was left off the roster. And they were looking for more power pitchers. And, of course, he was more finesse. They left him off the roster. I really thought he was going to come back the following year. And he never came back. He kind of, like a fellow former White Sox, Wilbur Wood, who I thought still had some stuff in the, in the tank back in the early 70s. And I really thought maybe the Red Sox, since he was Wood was originally from Massachusetts, I thought they would take a, a flyer on him. But he kind of like just disappeared, no fanfare, just um, retired from the game, much like Mark Burley. Burley, though, was uh, really, I, I'm hoping that baseball takes a, a real look at his stats. Uh, at a time when the balls were flying out of the ballpark, home runs, steroids, etc. Uh, so he was the leading pitcher. And, and basically, here's what I'm compiling. In order for a team... Of the 25 winners since 1995, the average runs scored for the offense is 5.08. Compare that to the Yankees right now. They're at 4.41. They're one of the worst in the American League right now. In fact, um, I, as I stated on the show, it's it's the worst case, worst offense in Yankee history of any any team that you would say had a legitimate shot at making a, a postseason run. Let me just get this uh, for you here. And right now the Yankees are averaging, ready for this, 4.41. They're 19 points under the league average of 4.6. Who's the top scoring team right now in the American League? The top team right now are the Astros in the American League with a 5.32. And um, the Blue Jays at 5.18. So you know what the Yankees are really confronted with. All right. I also did this. Now, I included the 2020 Dodgers in this. and But I didn't do win-loss record. I did games above 500 and not winning percentage. Two reasons for that. It would work with the 162-game schedule as well as the 154-game schedule. That's number one. Number two is that winning percentage, okay, I think it, it just to give you an indication of how dominant a team is, winning percentage is fine, but I think it's games over 500. It really shows you a dominant. And ready for this, the 98 Yankees, 66 games over 500 on their way. They averaged 5.56 runs a game. So they were well over the average of teams uh, 5.08 uh, of teams that won the World Series, okay? Well over the average. The average teams that have won the World Series since 1995, 29.6 games over 500. So basically, teams going into the World Series, uh, 96 and 66. Where does that put everybody? Well, going into today, Tampa Bay's in good shape that way of the three American League teams that are in, in front. The Astros are at 94 and 67, and the White Sox are at 93 and 68. Right now, you'd say that Tampa Bay, 29.6 is the average of the teams getting to the World Series over five, you know, over uh, 500 or whatever. Tampa Bay is right now 39 games over 500. So they're in good shape that way. All right. Um, and I will tell you this, I'm using the one loss record because I know that was another Bill James thing. Uh, Tampa Bay, remember they appeared last year? I guess they are not, uh, they are, you could actually argue they are built on Moneyball. They have gotten to the World Series. All right, here's Altuve, the leader, and as, as I said, the face of their franchise, and Aaron Judge, 
course, I would consider Aaron Judge right now the face of the Yankee franchise. But those are two components, uh, two teams that could be meeting in the postseason if everything goes well for them. Now, 180 home runs is the average number of home runs by a World Series winner. Where do the Yankees rate right now? The Yankees, again, they have 222. The fewest of any of the contenders, I have the White Sox at 189. Ready for this? Toronto has mashed the ball like crazy, 258. That's incredible. In the National League right now, you would have to say that uh, the I, I couldn't believe this, that the Giants in the National League were just outrageous with the number of home runs that they've hit this year. And, of course, Baumgartner, I'm not just showing you this because he was no longer obviously with them, but uh, he is, uh, uh, let me tell you, He's definitely on the Mount Rushmore for at least San Francisco Giants. The Giants have the 240 home runs. And I was looking at that roster. Now, they did improve it uh, during the season, especially after the July 31st trade. I just couldn't believe how many home runs they hit because uh, the perception was that the Giants were more like uh, spit and glue. They were putting the, the offense together, and they really came out of nowhere this year. But they have become – Obviously, the best record in baseball, they've become some buzzsaw in the uh, National League. Here's another one I was going to go up against. And I'm just using the Yankees just to give you, again, an idea. Ready for this? Runs scored against you. It's almost a run. It's over a run difference between the World Series champion and their run scored 5.08. And the run scored or, or the run given up 4.02. I don't really think that is all that. Um, I, obviously, you, you have to prevent runs. I didn't do the ERA for this reason. You can have one of those games where you uh, commit a lot of errors or uh, you give up a lot of runs and don't commit any errors. I really think it's this. It's not so much when you can. Well, I'm just trying to think about this. You could have a pitcher who gives up a ton of runs after an error, right? Two outs, a guy has an error, and maybe he loses it. Now he gives up five runs. Those are those runs are in charge as earned runs. They're they're um, they're unearned runs, but they still go against the team. It's not like the team can say, "All right, let's take that crooked number off." Off, off the scoreboard because you know we did commit an error. No, you got to overcome the error. So I did the one, you know, the runs um, against, and I discovered this that again using the Yankees or even the Giants here because they are the best record right now in the game. The Giants are scoring four point nine three runs a game. Of course, a little bit different because they're not playing with the DH. But here's where the Giants. The Giants are allowing only 3.66. The winner of the World Series of the last 25 years, 4.02. That's about 25% difference. That's huge. Uh, and even at the Giants giving up only, let's say, only scoring 4.93, that's pretty close to the 502. That's a huge gap, though, between runs scored and runs prevented. And the Giants... Oof, they're really making a case for themselves right there with the pitching. I did saves for a number of reasons. One is this, because saves have become uh, a big fixture in the game since 1969. Jerome Holtzman came up with the save. It was kind of used, but not in the same uh, framework as it has been in the last 40, 50 years. Do I think it's an important stat? Yes, I do. Do I think sometimes it's an overrated stat? Yes, I do. Um, sometimes you can come in and, um, and, and, and not get a save, but you win the game. And what I mean is this, I think ERA is kind of overrated for a relief pitcher. And here's what I mean. If you come in with a two run lead in the ninth inning, okay, you get the two outs and then all of a sudden you give up a solo home run, but then you nail down the third out. You get the save, even though your ERA for that particular inning is nine. 
Or you can come in, two outs, bases loaded, and walk the guy home. You, didn't, you blew the save, I get that, but your ERA is not charged. It goes to the pitcher that you relieved. Or you do this. Um, you pitch two-thirds of an inning, get the two outs, but then you can't cash home the third out, okay? The starter gets the loss or the previous pitcher gets the loss. Your ERA goes down because you pitched two-thirds and got uh, and uh, nobody scored on you, even though you gave up the winning run by walking them home. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so you pitched an inning and two-thirds there total. In the one, you gave up the run, but you got the save. In the other, you pitched two-thirds of scoreless relief, but you gave up the winning run by walking in a guy, even though he's not your responsibility. Okay. I look at this for the relief pitcher. I look at, all right, out of the save opportunities, right? You, you really have to start looking at it this way. Does he come in with a one run lead? How does he do with that? How does he do with the two run lead and a three run lead? All right. Obviously you don't care if he gives up two runs in, in a, a three run lead. Yeah, I know. <laughs> if you're like Earl Weaver and it's Dan Stanhouse, you're going to smoke <laughs> an entire uh, pack of cigarettes worrying to get those three outs, but you still get the win. And the other way, all right, you, you could be lights out, like I said, but still kind of ineffective in big spots. So that being said, I'm looking at the average saves for the winners, and here's how I'm looking at it. 45 seems to be the number of choice. It's the average number of saves by uh, a World Series winning team. There have been teams that have been over that, like 56 by the Kansas City Royals. There have been teams, even in this day and age, well under that, like the Atlanta Braves of 95 only had 34 team saves. Uh, the Boston Red Sox of 2013 only had 33 uh, team saves and yet there were 32 games over 500. Now, what does it mean? Maybe what I should be doing is this, equating the number of saves in terms of percentage to the number of games over 500 and looking at the blown saves and seeing how that is. That's just another um, case. It's just another more expansive research maybe for another day. Again, just judging on the Yankees, how are they doing with this? Well, let's face it. The Yankees right now, they're pitching. The Yankees have a total. Let me just see what they're pitching. The Yankees right now are allowing 4.16 runs per game. All right. I will tell you this, as I, I, I stated before, here's the last thing that I thought was very interesting, and that is on-base percentage. And this has been the big metric and all the rest of it. On-base percentage, and I'm just using the Yankees now, ready for this, the average on-base percentage, I think I do have it here, is 343. The Yankees right now have an on-base percentage of 323. Forget batting average because, right, the money ball people say, don't worry about batting average, even though it's very true. Uh, you still need a good batting average to have a good on-base percentage, okay? And as I, I keep pointing out, just take a look at Kevin Biggio. He draws a ton of walks, yet he's only played 79 games this year, albeit he has been hurt and all the rest of it. But, you know, he, he's lost some time because his batting average has been so poor. He's been in a slump all year. I still think he has some great talent there and he can be uh, a big-time player. But... You know, he's just having a bad year hitting the ball. Anyway, um, the Yankees are at 323. Now, it doesn't seem like a lot, but 343 means that you're getting hits, right? And the Yankees with a 4.41 uh, runs per game under the league average of 4.6. And considering that they have hit 222 home runs, Here's this team. It's it's really a, a series of solo shots followed by nothing else. 
yeah, maybe they're drawing walks, but nobody's nobody's following that with base hits. It, it's really a, a serious situation for the Yankees. All right, last thing I wanted to say as we're going forward, it should be an interesting uh, postseason. Like I said, I am rooting for all four teams to create a wild card uh, blockage and have baseball kind of figure it out. And we can have an, an extended regular season with four teams potentially squaring off for the two wild card spots. Hope you enjoyed the show. This is Willow Tool for Park Ridge Sports History. Again, thanking you for allowing me to come into your homes and talking all things sports. I'll be here with another edition next week. Thank you.